Good morning. Okay, well, that works. Um, so while preparing for this sermon, I always uh, go to my godly council just before, and I talk to the pastor's kids. And, uh, and I say, okay, I'm going to preach. What do you want me to do? And um, one of them said, just make sure there's a joke about my dad. And I said, I got you covered on that one. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I have to tell you that um, I started this sermon. Pastor Mike called me, I don't know, Monday or Tuesday. said, hey, are you ready? I said, yeah, I'm about two-thirds of the way there. I'm good. I, I got this. No problem. About Wednesday, Thursday comes. I'm, I'm going to take Friday off. I'm going to polish this thing up. I got up and went to the gym on Friday morning. I teach CrossFit at 5 a.m. Get home, and I start, and the entire sermon that I had done got thrown out. So, uh, and as Pastor Georgie just said to me, God is doing a new thing. And uh, he is doing a new thing with this, this as well. Um, have you ever noticed that leaders look a lot alike? No, really. Have you ever you, you thought about that leaders look a lot alike. If you don't, Pastor Mike, Pastor Joey, Pastor Steve, Pastor John, all follically challenged. And so when I got called to uh, when when I got called to to become a pastor again, I thought I yeah I was like I can't be a pastor at living. Oh, Pastor Sano, I don't want to forget him too. I can't forget. I, I got to go bald to be a pastor at Living Water. So, no, past, uh, it's funny because leaders will look a lot alike. We're going to talk about two specific leaders who are, let's just say, better than 700 years apart. But they look a lot alike. I mean a lot alike. So, let's pray. Father, I pray right now that you would set me aside and that your Holy Spirit take charge of this place. Lord, I pray that your word be fresh today. In your name, amen. If you're taking notes today, um, the, the title is Mirror of a Champion. Mirror of a Champion. We've got a lot of different thoughts of what a champion is. We do. And, I, and I'm going to tell you some stories about some really big champions in my life as well, as well as biblical champions. But champions look a lot alike. And here's the deal. They want to finish the unfinished. Think about that as we get going. Champions want to finish the unfinished. They want to get this thing together. They just really, really want to finish this. I've always found it interesting, the meanings of names. So you, you guys looked up your names in the Hebrew. So Samuel in Hebrew is name of God, asked of God, and heard by God. Um, I, I read that when I was a teenager and went, I don't deserve that name. How many of you re relate to me? where immediately the first thing that comes in is, is that you don't deserve that name. We're going to talk about two leaders that their names are pretty similar to, not their first names. It's Joshua and Nehemiah. Um, neither one of them are similar in how you say their name, but they're very similar leaders, and they're about 800 years apart. And so it's, it's amazing to look at this. So with, with their names, um, Nehemiah is God comforts, and Joshua is Lord saves. If you, as we get into this, those things really kind of come together. So let's talk, look about Joshua for a minute. I know we're in Nehemiah, and we, we're going through Nehemiah and Ezra, but just for a second, Joshua takes over from Moses and finishes something, right? He finishes leading, leading them out and into a new land. It's, he knows that he's got to finish this, and he's going to finish strong. That's what makes him a good leader. Nehemiah is not different than that. Nehemiah comes from somewhere totally different. The difference is, is Nehemiah never got to see the promised land because they were exiled from there about 150 years before, and Nehemiah certainly is not 150 years old at this point. A little bit about Nehemiah is he's a cupbearer to the king of Persia. Now, if you are thinking the same way I'm thinking, I was thinking cupbearer, he fills his water up, that's, that's what he does. In, in reality, a cupbearer is one of the closest to the king that there is. He tests the food to make sure it's not poison. He stands with the king all the time. He meets the needs of the king exactly where the king is, and he knows how to lead because he sits there with the king every single day. 
The interesting thing about Nehemiah of never being able to see this, never knowing what's going on, and not really knowing what's going on in his land because he's in Persia, he hears something. And, and again, I want to challenge you with this, is that a champion sees what's not finished and finishes it. And it doesn't matter how many years there are in between. It doesn't matter. He sees what there is and he finishes it. In Nehemiah 1, 3 through 4, it says, And they said to me, The remnant of the providence of whom I survived and exiled of great trouble and chain, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are destroyed. Now, here's a cupbearer listening to this, and all of a sudden, God grabs a hold of him. As soon as I heard these words, I sat, I wept, I mourned. 150 years has gone by. I sat, I weeped, I mourned. Why? He knows something has to be finished. It has to be finished. And so he sits there, and then he says, I said, O Lord in heaven, great and awesome, God who keeps his covenant steadfast and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Is there a timeline on God's love? Is there a timeline on God's commandments? There's not. When they challenged Jesus, they challenged him with the Old Testament. And he goes, hey, they're fresh. Guess what? God is doing a new thing. It doesn't matter how many times I read the Bible or I read something, something pops out to me. And it's like, you know, I grew up, I tell people I was born in a pew. I, I, I was born in a pew and I've been in church all my life. And I can't tell you how many times I've read or seen the stories of Nehemiah, but he did a fresh thing to me as we started putting this together. I'm a teacher, so I want to get really deep into the, into the weeds on stuff. And you know what God said to me in my apartment? No, the weeds aren't where I want you this week. Get out of the weeds. I don't want you there. I don't want you to get into all the technical stuff that a teacher gets into. I want you to just lay out what I got for you. And I'm like, okay, you can't really argue with that, right? So the first thing that Nehemiah does, the very first thing that shows me that he's a champion, he drops to his knees. He fasts, he prays, and he goes, I have a new thing. I got to fix this. I, I got to fix this. So something that I got to do. Now, this is, this is going to be interesting. So the, one of the headers is, uh, the Lord will, uh, a leader will come under opposition um, but know what to do. So I've been a leader most of my life. I'll tell you what my daughter asked me in a, in a few minutes, but I've, been, I, I've gone to fire service training, leadership. I'm an assistant chief in the fire department. But just about everywhere I've stepped, I've stepped into leadership because God's called me to do that, to be a leader in one way or the other. I've learned so many um, worldly ways to lead, but the ways that God teaches us to lead in the Bible are dramatically different incredibly different because they're not this technical powerpoint that's up on a slide they're in your heart and you're leading from your heart and that's a leader that's amazing it i was i was sitting there and um my daughter riley who'll be in second service um, is going to ywam youth with a mission now now i gotta tell you i'm proud of my kids all over the place every one of them i love on my kids i'm proud of everything that they do we're sitting having a conversation, and out of nowhere, and this is, this is I had gotten assigned this like in January, but, but, you know, like a good pastor, I waited for a little while before I got into it. And, and my daughter last week goes, Dad, do I have to be a leader? I was like, what? He goes, she goes, no, I've watched you your whole life lead. Do, do I have to do that? Because I feel like everything I do points me to be a leader. And I said, yep. <laughs> yeah no you do you need to be a leader you want to know something funny it was 40 years difference to the time I was called into the ministry until I stand on this platform 40 years difference and I was 19 years old and my daughter is 17 and she'll still be on YWAM when she's 19 God is doing a new thing 40 years later he's creating leadership out of these kids. Don't you? I, I go to those kids all the time. The pastor's kids just crack me up. They speak into my life all the time. I told Joey, your kids heal me and they don't even know they're doing it. 
They, they literally do. I went over to their house. Joey was gone. I went over to their house, and I, and I <laughs> sat down. I called Beth, and I said, can I come cry on your couch? Go, yeah, come on over. You would think that's odd, right? No, it's not odd. So I come sit down. I start talking about that. I didn't cry, though. Uh, I come down, sit and talk to Beth, get wise counsel from Selma, the, the wise one, Beth's mom. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there, and immediately in comes Al. Oh, yeah, I call her Al. And she just runs in, gets on the piano, and starts playing. We're in the middle of this really good conversation. Just starts playing. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, because it just breaks up things. You're going to come under a lot of opposition, but the interesting thing about the opposition, and Riley's going to come under opposition. The day she took her call to go to the mission field, I said, people are going to oppose you. And what you need to do is spend time on your knees. I was enrooted, and God called me back to becoming a pastor. Enrooted. And I was like, I can't do this. I started this 19 years ago. He goes, that's a season, my friend. It's amazing what God will do if you're willing to step into leadership. And, it, and a lot of people get really kind of scared about leadership. Yeah, I am too. I am. I, every day I go to work, I lead. And the decisions that I make mean whether I go to someone's house and open up the door and say, I'm sorry they died in a fire or not. You see, I'm old, so I make the decisions on the outside. And they're really glad when I get there because they don't want to make those decisions. So, but there's decisions that are sitting there. Now, Nehemiah, and, 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 and as we look at the two different ones, Nehemiah and Joshua, I want you to see something very common in these two scriptures, okay? I am horrible at reading scriptures. You'll forgive me, right? Right? Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Nehemiah 4.14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and has fought for your brothers, sons, and daughters, and wives, and your homes. He's already fought the fight. Okay? All right. Now Joshua. Now remember, there's, there's almost 800 years difference between these guys. Now I don't know about you, but I can't remember things eight minutes ago, let alone 800 years ago. He says this in Joshua. He says, I said to them, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord will do all your enemies against whom you fight. If the Lord goes in front of you and fights the battle, who's going to win? I say this all the time. Listen, I am so blessed to be your men's ministry pastor. I am. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to shout out. We have seen addictions broke, marriages healed. We have seen true people, these guys, literally stand up and be transparent in what they're, what's going on. Be transparent. They just lay it out. And I'm blown away because, you know, I, I've been in men's ministry and done men's ministry a lot of my life. And, I, and you know, Joey and I have talked and, like, we treat men different and in and, and how we get them. You put one slide up for a paint and sip for women and you'll get 2,000 women. You put up one sign for a Bible study for guys, you'll get five. We're just built different. But if you go and you go shoulder time and you lead, and this is what I told my team, you go and you go talk to someone face to face, they'll show up. In faith, I ordered 10 Bible study books. 22 guys showed up. I, I almost lost it. I did lose it. I, I was like, I just can't believe that this happened. He goes before you. You really can't lose, can you? Nehemiah reflects and Joshua reflects and says, God's gone before us. He's going to fight this battle for you. And what do we do as humans? And it's human nature. We're afraid. We, we go into fear. And, and listen, at the end of this, I'm going to tell you a very scary story and how a Nehemiah in this church saved my life. Never told this story. I talked to the, my Nehemiah um, and told him that it was coming. So we'll see how this goes. It, it, it shouldn't amaze you that there's so much stuff that happens between the Old Testament and the New Testament that just jumps out at you. We always look at Isaiah and the, and the prophecies that happen in Isaiah and the things that come true in the New Testament. You know, you look at Joshua and Nehemiah, they're a long ways apart, but their leadership style is amazing. So Nehemiah goes and jumps on his knees and he goes to the king of Persia, 
And he says, look, I got to do this. Now, now understand that the cupbearer never leaves the king. Never leaves the king. And what do you think the king said? And he tells him why. My God has said I need to finish what has not been finished. Well, you can go. You can go. And not only can you go, I'm going to send some soldiers with you. What? Because he's that important. He's lived his life with the king of Persia and served God. And, and I have to think the king of Persia has seen this and knows that when he comes to him and says, I got a new thing and I got to go do this. And I'm really sorry. I know this is what I've done forever. I've been here forever and I've worked on this forever. Nehemiah says, I got to finish this. I got to go. Do you think he came under opposition? The Bible says he came under great opposition. Not only that, they tried to storm him as he starts to build the, the walls back up. And, and they, he moves soldiers around. And even at that, he works, works at a wicked pace. And he finishes the wall. Nehemiah 6.15 says he finishes the wall in 52 days. Now look, they're building something out in front of my house right now that I swear is going to take 52 years. They're just never going to finish this off, I swear. That wall still stands today. There's a section of the wall that Nehemiah built still standing around Jerusalem today. We serve a God that was then and a God that is now. Do you hear what I say? Okay. So it, that's just a fact. I mean, it, it is amazing. I get chills when I think this is still standing because somebody, a champion, said, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish what God said to finish. And even though he came under opposition, he still finishes it. A leader um, is to follow as well. Have you ever heard the term servant leadership? Okay. So servant leadership really kind of came out of, uh, go ahead with the picture. This is kind of servant leadership as it, as it stands, right? Now this is what the world looks at as okay, of, of servant leadership. You've got a boss telling people what to do and away you go. They're still slaving. But a leader is standing at the front. And if I was as, as, as craftsy as Pastor Mike, I would have put a cross in front of that. And then he would have been pointing at that cross because a leader will always point you back to the cross. You cannot win the battles without that. You have to have this. You've got to learn to lead and not be a boss. I, I, and I've said this. I, I start sermons the same way. I am broken in need of a Savior. And if he's not in front of me, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. All right. So leading with this courage, it's amazing. You, you, you know, when you say I'm broken in need, in a, need of a Savior, technological difficulties, I'm broken in need of a Savior, um, some people may see that as weakness. But, but I'm going to tell you right now, every time I've ever thought I've had it together, I've failed. Every time. And, and I've just said, hey, I'm broken. And Lord, if you're leading me, if you're doing what's in this picture, I'm solid. Do a new thing in my life. Do a new thing in this church. Do a new thing. We want to see revival. We want to see all kinds of stuff come. And it's going to take leaders in this church, and I'm talking about you guys, to stand up and say, I'm ready to do a new thing. So, uh, you know, again, being afraid, if you saw the two, both Joshua and Nehemiah both addressed fear. And they both addressed it in the same way. My Lord is stronger than your fear. It's, it, I honestly believe that in Nehemiah's heart, at the, at the moment that he heard that, when he fell and he broke, and he said, oh, oh I, I got a new thing I got to do. It was at that point that God said, now I can do something. I got a guy that he, the first thing that he does is falls on his face in front of God. And he fasts and he, and he lays it down. And then this champion says, I got to finish this. And, and it's not, I want to finish it. I've got to finish this. It's super important that this gets finished. A Lord who leads. Nehemiah is a reflection of Joshua, who is a reflection of Jesus. 
And there's and the, and what basically what this is is if you look at foreshadowing and you start looking at these things, Pastor Mike uses a word called represent, and I'm going to use it a many times in the next couple paragraphs. And representing is different than representing. Representing is something that is different than representing. Representing is a mirror image. Representing, I represent Yom Living Water. Represent, I want to represent Jesus. Does that make sense? It's different. It's different in its meaning. And I honestly believe that in this particular point, when you look at Joshua and you look at Nehemiah, all that they want to do is represent Jesus. Are they going to represent him? They are, but they know that representing him is more important, affects more things than anything. And so that's, that's what's really important. So I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about uh, my meeting Pastor Mike. Um, it was at a Young Life auction, I think. He was standing in line. And I, I, I'd heard through the grapevine that Living Water was going to do a new thing, that they were going to start something in Yelm. And uh, somebody next to me says, hey, that's, the, that's the new pastor of the new church in Yelm. That's that. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go talk to him. He said, hey, um, um, are you the pastor, new pastor of the church in Yelm? And he, yes, with a question mark. Because it, kind of it was still kind of a secret squirrel thing. Hey, come on, we're in Yelm. Is there anything secret squirrel in Yelm? Yeah, that's not going to be secret squirrel. <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought to myself, Oh, no, no, no. As I right then, it was a calling that said, you're going with him. And I just, I, was, I said, no, I don't want to do that. I, I'm, I'm being honest. I, I, this was my third start church. Third, meaning blue chairs, down, stages, in. Three times, I was finally in a church that was thriving. And God said, I want you to go finish something that I'm starting. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. So I, I, I talked to Pastor Mike a little bit, and I was like, okay. So I went to him, and I, and I talked to him, and I said, look, I'm in charge of men's ministry at this church, and I'm going to leave right. I'm going to do this right. And the, I, I, I can only imagine he thought I was completely nuts. So... I'm going to leave right. I, I, I got called to do a new thing. I don't want to, but I'm going to. And so, and it wasn't long after that that I ended up on leadership, but, but there was a lot that, that happened. And let me just tell you, in, in God's faithfulness of new, doing a new thing, I met one of my best friends. We both moaned every morning that we had to do this. We got up. We got to the church, 7 o'clock. Sometimes the trailer was in one spot, and other times it slid to other spots. But we unloaded it. We got it up so that God's people could come in. And I met Joey during that time, and then Ian came to, comes in after. And these are all my, my friends. And, and I have to tell you that it was the beginning of a new thing, not just for this church, but between Joey and I. Pastor Mike was there too, but there was a connection at that point because I was faithful enough to do a new thing that I said, I met some people that changed my life. Joey is one of my Nehemiahs. Not that you're not, Pastor Mike. Joey is one of my Nehemiahs. Joey doesn't judge me when I call him. Joey doesn't do anything. He just listens and he gives awesome advice. And both of my best friends are younger than me, and they both speak wisdom into my life. you got to do a new thing. You've got to step out. Now, this was not the direction I was going with this sermon. I just want you to know. This was not it. I was going to talk about how high the walls were and how what, and it was just not what happened. So the leadership of this church is not perfect, people. The moment we put this walls up, put this up at 3 a.m., Michael, put these walls up, it was flawed because people walked in. But they were people willing to do a new thing. So I'm just challenging now. 
It's going to take you outside of what your, your norms are. These new things, they're going to take you outside. Here's the deal. I can say this, that through God's faithfulness of doing a new thing, through that faithfulness, I have friends in this church, you guys all included, that I literally would go into the pits of hell with and fight my way out. Because you guys are willing to do a new thing. It's something different. You're willing to step out. God's going to call you to do things. He may not call you to be the men's ministry pastor. He may not call you to, to do, but he's calling you. And he's calling you loud. And it's your turn to think, okay, where are you calling me to, Lord? And sometimes you get really scared about this. And you think, I can't do this. But I'm going to tell you that this is how we're going to lockstep and win Yelm for Jesus. Is that if we start getting in the same mind, and this same thing, you know that we're in a battle, right? You understand that. This is a battle. And, and Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers that present darkness, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We will kick butt. Ooh, I said that out loud. Sorry. I, I believe it. I know what we wrestle against. We recognize it. But guess what? Even though we're doing a new thing, he's already won the battle. He's already gone ahead. He's already conquered him. And we get to walk in and go, dude, look at Yum. This is awesome. Look at the relationships you get to build. Look at the things you get to do lockstep with each other. Look at the life you get to have. It's amazing what Jesus will do. It's just absolutely, just completely floors me, the reflection of Jesus that you are, that, that you represent to me every single day. These kids, you missed it during the warm-up. They're over here dancing, and I loved every second of it. Lord, make me free enough to dance. David, my friend, my brother in the Old Testament, danced naked in front of the Lord. I ain't going to do that. I'm just going to tell you. It ain't going to happen. But, yeah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Here's the deal. If you choose to go out and do a new thing and finish things that are not complete, you're going to be blessed. You will be blessed to do it. You're going to be blessed. Do you think Nehemiah was blessed? Yes. Do you think Joshua was blessed? Yes, he was blessed. But you know, you really, if, if you look at things, you're going to be blessed. John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever believes in me, also works for what that I do. Greater works will these do <clears throat> because he's going to the Father. What's that mean? It means, it means that you can do what Jesus did. That you can do what Nehemiah did. That you can do what Joshua did. Because like the Old Testament, they did sacrifices. Jesus came so that we could fulfill that and do a new thing. It's amazing what God does coming from the Old Testament to the New Testament to today in Yelm, Washington. Look, we don't have perfect, um, perfect leadership. If you think we do, you're absolutely wrong. Um, we are real people that do real things and make real mistakes. When I was a little kid, I used to look at the pastor and he looked so big to me and so far away and so, you know, you couldn't touch him type thing. The thing I love about this church is these people are real people. They're real people. And, and we're all real people. So, you know, there's not a lot of perfect, but the only way that we can really be perfect leaders is as if Jesus leads us. You know, all those fire service classes that I learned, they're great. They really are. But they're not perfect. They're not perfect because they're not biblically based. They don't go back to where Jesus leads you. So listen, you guys, it's, it's just amazing when you think about how God does a new thing and how we walk into this and how two guys, 800 years apart-ish. If you say ish, then it can be like 100 either side, right? So 800 years apart say the same thing. Now there's some things we need to conquer because 800 years apart they said the same thing and it was about fear. And I'm not somebody that doesn't have fear. I do have fear. I'm not. And I know you have fear. But it's amazing how many times in 800 years apart, he goes, hey, 
we got this. God's got it. And we need to remember in our fear, because we have it, that he's gone before us and he's won the battle. He hasn't, he's not in the middle of the battle. He's already won that battle for you. So, you know, only perfect leadership in him is perfect leadership. That's how we get to, to, to learn about him. And, and I'm really glad that he tore my whole thing apart. He just tore it apart. I'm super happy about that. So I got to tell you, and I have not told this story to anyone, I don't believe, but I'm going to tell you a story about a Nehemiah in my life. I didn't make it through this without crying, but I'm going to make it through it today without crying. You see, this has been a pretty rough year in my life, and it's been an amazing year in my life. It's been a year of affirmations. It's been a year of almost dying, because I got COVID, and I ended up in the ICU, and it was scary. Now, I wasn't scared for me. I just want you to know. I'm laying there, and I was like, okay, Lord, this is probably going to be it. I couldn't breathe. I had 35% of my lung capacity at one point. I was sick. And I'm like, okay, if, it's, if this is it, then this is it. And I'm reading texts go back and forth about me. <laughs> I can't text. I, my, my, my daughter, Ashley, my rock, my oldest daughter, she, she's taking care of it. You know, she's letting everybody know what's going on. And I'm seeing them, seeing them go back and forth. And there was one night where I'm laying there in bed and I'm realizing that, you know, it really honestly could be it. And I said, Lord, if this is it, fight the battles for me. Because there's a lot that's unfinished. There's a lot that's unfinished. And I knew right then it wasn't it. But I was still really sick. I got home after 10 days, six days in the ICU. They wanted to intubate me. I'm a paramedic by trade. Um, they said, hey, we're, we want to intubate you. And I said, you first. <laughs> I, I said that. And uh, the nurse that was in the room was one of my fire cadets growing up. And he looked at the doc and he goes, hey, doc, don't argue with this one. <laughs> God wasn't finished with me. And, I, and I'm really grateful that he wasn't. But it was a really dark time, really dark. I got home, and I'm quarantined for another 10 days. And I don't remember whether I called her or whether she called me, but I got a phone call from an angel from heaven, and her name is Dory. I, I honestly, I don't remember a lot of it. I just know that I was in a very dark place. And I started to talk to Dory, and Dory and I had conversations are generally about two hours long. This was not an exception. I was sick. My voice wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. You ask Joey, he'll tell you he never wants to talk to me like that again, where my voice was going. And I was laying out what, was, what I felt was defeated to Dory. And I was like, look, I don't want to be around people right now. I'm scared. I don't, I don't want to do any of this stuff. I'm scared. And Dory, in all her wisdom, the way that she is, says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And she sat and she listened. And you know, Dory knew that night that God needed to do a new thing. That God was walking me out of something. And she called me every day after that, every single day. And not that the rest of my friends didn't, but for some reason, Dory became my Nehemiah who recognized very quickly that God was not finished with me and she was not going to let go of me until I knew God was not finished with me. That's being Nehemiah in someone's life. That's stepping in and saying, I'm going to do a new thing. I, I want to do a new thing. Thank you, Lord, for walking me through that. And I know a lot of you have the same stories. I'm just telling you that the people in this church, the people in this community, the people that you bump into day to day, you don't know which one of them is going to be your Nehemiah. But be open to it. Be open to it, because it changed me. Dory is an amazing person. If you've never got to know her, she's definitely kept all of this straight over the years. Um, she can do decor like no, no other, but she did a decor in my heart that if I hadn't have talked to Dory, I honestly, I was in a very dark spot. And I wasn't calling anybody. I was that dark. I wasn't going to pick up the phone. She goes, I thought I would I'd call Pastor Mike. And I'm like, you had it totally handled. And if you know anything about Pastor Mike, he trusts his leaders. 
you know, he, he trusts his leaders and he trusts us to let him know what's going on too. But Dory kept that. that she kept that in her heart because she's like, I got this. And I will never, ever forget that phone call, neither will she. And we talk about it now and we kind of smile because God's going to do a new thing. He's not finished. So I don't care what champions you think you are. I don't care if you think that, you know, the Seattle Seahawks should go to the Super Bowl and they should be champions. Dory is my champion. Now, there's many stories that I have that about people in this church that are my champions. You can come up, Dory. That are my champions. All that I can say to you guys is honestly, he took my message, tore it up, and gave me this one. And I hope that it's something that, that resonates with you. Because I laid on my, I sat on my couch when I finished it. I finished the type. Uh oh. <laughs> finished the type, and I literally text the leadership team. I'm la- sitting on my couch weeping, and I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit goes before me and that He does a thing on Sunday. Because He wrecked me when I sat there on Friday. So thank you for the opportunity. And I, I just, you know, it's amazing to be part of this church. And it's amazing to be part of the leadership of this church. And he's calling you. You need to listen. He's calling you. I don't know what he's calling you to do. That's between you and God. But he's calling you. And just listen because he's already won the battles to get you to wherever that is. Whether it's being a mom, which is a massive calling. Whether it's being a dad, which is a massive calling whether you work in IT, which is a massive calling, you can do exactly what my grandma said. You can be a pastor anywhere you are. So with that, can I pray for you? And and can you just close your eyes, put your heads down for a second? And and I just really got the sense as we were going through this, and I've talked about this before, that there's a fear that's in people's hearts. And if you have a fear in your heart, nobody's looking, could you just raise your hand just so that I know and I can pray for you? Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's, it's really important that I say this to you guys who have fear. It's easy for me to say this where I am right now, but he's got you. He's fighting the battles in front of you and you need to let him take it. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for going before us and thank you for creating a new thing for us. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in your name. Amen.